I'd like to say good morning. Time has arrived for our morning worship to begin. It's good to see all of you that are in person this morning. And for those that are online, we thank you for tuning in on our morning worship on this morning. We ask in advance that you remember those that are on our, our sick list, those that are in the hospital, and those that are at home. Continue to pray for Sister Deborah Covington and also for her mom, Sister Billy Covington. Keep Sister Tutan in your prayers also. Um, she, she needs your prayers also this morning. Um, pay for Sister, Sister Pat Thomas and Brother Marshall and all of, all of those that are at home this morning. Continue to keep uh, Brother and Sister Richardson in your prayers also. Also, Sister uh, Brother Anderson and his family. Continue to pray for them also. Also, we'd like to, like to thank Sister Dunn for her visitation, checking in on Sister Covington uh, this week. Uh, I'd like to thank her for that and for each of you that, that look out for one another, look out for those that are on our sick list. Our call to all the scripture this morning is taken from Psalms 144. Psalms 144. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Continue to uh, pray for Brother Wright, too, as he deal with dialysis. And for all of those that dealing with dialysis, uh, that is definitely a challenge. Psalms 144 and verses 1 through 4. And it reads, Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I trust. He subdued my peoples under me. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? Or the son of man that make his account of him. Verse four, man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passes away. What are you talking about, David? He's talking about life itself. He's letting us know that life is short. He says it's like the shadow that passes away. And then when we, when we look at a parallel scripture in the New Testament, the book of James talks about, James 4.14 talks about, he says life is, life is but a, a, a vapor here for a little while and then vanish away. So, because life is so short, we should live for God while we have time. We should live for God while we have time. We don't have time to be digging up bones. Y'all remember that song? That I think Randy Travis used to sing that song. We don't have time to be, life is too short to be digging up bones. And then the writer t lets us know in the text, he says, don't waste your life on things that has no lasting value. Don't waste your time, don't waste your life on stuff that has no value. So, 
Let's live the best we can for God. Let's live for God. Well, why? Because he's the only one that can make our life worthwhile. He's the only one that can make our life meaningful. Bow with me, please. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you for life itself. The air that we, we breathe this morning. Thank you. Thank you for food on our tables and clothes on our backs. And somewhere to lay our head, Father, we thank you. Father, we come this morning thanking you for what you've already done. We may be faced with trials and tribulations at this time. May have pain in our bodies this time. But when we look back over our lives, we can see all of the valleys and all the mountains that you have brought us from. And we know that you didn't bring us this far to leave us. Kind Father, we just thank you this morning. We ask your forgiveness because we do sin and we do show forward from time to time. We beg you for your forgiveness this morning. And then, Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your son to die for us that we might have a right to the tree of life if we believe. Father, we know that it, 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 get, it get tough on this side sometimes. It get hard sometimes on this side. We lose loved ones on this side. But Father, we, we beg you this morning to be that leaning post for us when we lean in, Father. Be that hedge. Keep that hedge around us and let us know and let us know that you are a jealous God and that you don't want us to have anything or anyone before you thank you father we just we just beg you this morning for for your grace and for your mercy and please and please father look in on the sick here Look in on the sick here at the Scenic Woods congregation and in our families, Father. Bless us one by one in the way that you see we stand in need of. Kind Father, you've been good to us. If we, can, we can look around and, and see where you brought us from and how you kept us. Even as we travel the dangerous highways in this city and in this country. You have kept us thus far. And we beg him. We beg you for your continuous protection. And for your love. Please father continue to. Look down upon us. As we travel on this time. Side of life. Help us. Help us to hold on. We are faced with so many challenges, Father, that as we grow older, we didn't think we would have to face, but we, we are facing so many challenges in this times in our life. We, we beg you this morning to help us to hold on when things don't go as they should in our life. Help us to hold on. When we lose loved ones, help us to hold on. When our spouses don't act right, we help us to hold on. When our children don't act right, help us to hold on. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being such a good God. And we thank you. We thank you for your love. For your love is our security. And we beg it all in the name of Jesus. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.
turn to page 50 in the white book. I'm going that way. Page 50. If you have it, let us sing. I've heard of a land of joy and peace and wonderful life. A beautiful place of mansions fair and skies ever bright. Where all who obey the Savior dear forever shall stay. And having been saved by grace divine, I'm going that way. I'm going that way. I'm going that way. And Jesus the Savior I adore is with me each day. I'm clinging to him and never to stray. Yes, sing in his praises all day long. I'm going that way. I know I shall meet him at the gate when trials are past. I know I shall meet him face to face in glory and last. And oh, I believe that when we meet, well done, he will say, for trust in his soul, redeem in love, I'm going that way, I'm going that way, I'm going that way. Jesus the Savior I adore is with me each day. I'm clinging to him and never to stray. Yes, sing in his praises all day long. I'm going that way. Page 26 in the white book. Worship him. Page 26. If you have it, let us sing. We have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. We have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. We have come into house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. Oh, worship Him, Jesus Christ our Lord. So forget yourself and magnify the Lord and worship him. So forget about yourself and magnify the Lord and worship him. So forget about yourself 
and magnify the Lord and worship Him. Oh, worship Him. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us bow our heads in prayer and concentrate on Him and worship Him. Let us bow our heads in prayer and concentrate on Him and worship Him. Let us bow our heads in prayer and concentrate on Him and worship Him. Oh, worship Him, Jesus Christ. Reason follows. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. May God have a blessing to the reading of Our Father, the creator of the heaven and earth, we come at this time, Father, thanking you for waking us up this morning. We have sinned and come short of your glory. Sometimes we get weak. But Father, we know through you we can be strong again. So Father, we just pray that you will strengthen us where we're weak, build us up where we're being torn down. Father, we, we know that we're in your hand at all times. When we are sick, we go to the doctor. But Father, we know that we are still in your hand because the doctors don't really understand. Yeah. They say this is it, but you have the last say. Yes. Yes. So we know that we are always in your hand. When there are wrecks on the road, we say, oh my goodness, we were lucky. But we wasn't lucky. No. We was in your hands. You yes. guided yes. us through. Yes. So, Father, we want to say thank you this morning. Thank you. thank you, Father. And, Father, we just continue to pray for those that are sick this morning. We know, Father, that the doctors, again, say what medication we need. But we know it's through you that all things are possible. Yes. And we thank you, Father. We thank you for coming down, shedding your blood, in order that we, through you, would have the right to the tree of life. So again, we thank you for your son who died in our stead. We come, Father, asking your blessings upon those this morning for the families, for the mass shooting in Chicago. We pray, Father, that you will be with them, that you will comfort those families this morning because they say that was a child seven years old. And Father, we know and if we lose one of our loved ones, we know how we feel, Father. Yes. So we just pray that you will be with them. Yes. And Father, again, you said there will be walls, rumors of walls. Yes. And Father, we always think that there will be overseas somewhere. But we know, Father, that it could be in our own country. Yes. 
So, Father, we ask you to bless our president this morning and all those that surround him, that the decision they make will be according to your will. We just can't thank you enough for our first responders because they are there to take care of us. And we ask your blessings upon them this morning, Father, that you will protect them from all hurt, harm, and danger. Be with us, Father, as we go through your service this morning. We pray that Brother Darrell will speak your word in a way that it will be acceptable to your sight, in your sight. And we pray, Father, that the word that he speaks, he will speak them in a way that from the youngest to the oldest may be yeah. able to understand it. Yeah. And maybe someone will come running after him, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. Again, Father, we, we ask your blessings upon all our family members, yeah. all our children, and we pray, Father, for the schools throughout the land and country. We see, Father, that the ones, the teachers that we thought we could trust, Father, we see they are going in left field. So, Father, we just pray that you will be with them and keep our children safe. Yeah. Father, yeah. again, we just, again, we, we can't thank you enough for the things that you've done for us through your grace and your mercy because we know we didn't make it on our own. Yeah. So, Father, yeah. again, we, we thank you for the food, the clothes, the shelter. Yeah. We thank you for your sunshine. We thank you for your rain. And Father, we just pray that you will be with us as we further go through your service. And not only through your service, Father, but as we leave here, be with us. Let us walk that life that others may see you in us and come running after them. What must I do to be saved? Again, Father, we just want to say thank you. Because you've been better to us than we have been to ourselves. And we know this. And you say, Father, that if we obey your word and continue therein, you say our days have been numbered, but we might have longer days. So, Father, we just again say thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us turn to page one in the white book. I've had some requests this morning. If I'm not sure of the words, I have to do it next Sunday. Or if y'all have a request for me and you think about it during the week, call me or send me a text so I can prepare myself. That way I'm prepared and I'm not looking like I don't know what I'm doing when I get up here before you. Page one. We're going to attempt it. If you have it, let us sing. There are some things that I may not know. There are some places I can't go, I cannot go, but I am sure. thing that my God is real for I can feel him deep within yes my God is real he's so real in my soul my God is for he has washed and made me whole. His love for me, just like a gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. Some folk may die, some folk may scorn, they can desert and leave me alone, leave me alone, but as for me, I'll serve the Lord. My God is real, for I can feel. 
feel him in my heart. Yes, my God is real. He's so real in my soul. My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. His love for me, just like a gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. I cannot tell just how you felt when Jesus washed your sins away, your sins away. But since that day, yes, since that I, God has been real, for I can feel his holy power. Yes, my God is real. He's so real. My soul, my God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. His love for me, just like a gold, my God is real. For I can feel him in my soul. Amen. Somebody is happy to be here. Amen. I hear you. And truly our God is real. Yes. Thank you, brother. He's real in my soul. We appreciate these songs of Zion and these prayers that were offered up on this morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm happy to be in the house of the Lord on this morning. There are many other places I could be. Uh, I, I don't feel I would be blessed uh, like I will be this morning, just being amongst those of like faith. Let us go to Revelations chapter 1. As you can see, I'm getting right, in, right into it. I don't have much time to waste this morning. Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. Revelation chapter 1, or should I say the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. John writes, On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash, a priestly sash, around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. 
His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Verse 16, in his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. I would like to speak from the subject this morning, conserving the eternal flame. Conserving the eternal flame. It all makes sense after a while, I promise you. John is writing to the seven churches located in Asia Minor. On the onset, it is important to note that these Christians were about to face some of the most barbaric acts of persecution we'll ever read about in antiquity. And here we see Jesus in the midst of them, commending them for what they are doing well, but also rebuking them for the things they are neglecting. It is almost as if he is reminding them of their weaknesses in effort to fortify them in preparation for what is to come. This makes sense because when a body of believers lose passion, and become neglectful. There is a loss of community impact, a loss of relevance, and stagnation and complacency will ultimately be the end result. So this morning I want to talk to you, speak to you about the importance of keeping the flames of our faith burning brightly in order to share the presence of God with the world. Just as a lamp cannot fulfill its purpose, if, it, if its light dims, we too must ensure that our spiritual lights shine brightly for all to see. Jesus puts it this way in Luke chapter 8 and verse number 16. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. Now, many people are afraid of the book of Revelation, and some of them ought to be. Uh, some, some people ought to leave the book of Revelation alone. It'll mess you up if you don't put some time into studying it. Uh, because John uses symbolic language throughout. And this morning, we're going to have to piece a few things together. Will you be patient with me this morning? We're going to have to piece a few things together in order to fully understand the message. And then we'll talk about how it applies to us today. First thing I want you guys to note is that in verse number one, he says, This is the revelation of Jesus the Christ. Not merely a revelation, because throughout history many things have been revealed. But John makes it clear that this is the revelation of Jesus the Christ. He sees Jesus in all of his splendor. This is not the battered and bruised Jesus on his way to the cross, but a judge with fire in his eye ready to execute judgment and promote justice. This is not the silent servant standing in the judgment halls, for his voice was like the sound of a loud trumpet and rushing waters. No, we don't see him weeping by the tomb of a friend, but John sees him as king of kings and lord of lords. He is the alpha, the omega, the first, and the last, the beginning, and the end. It is interesting, John said, when I saw him, his face was shining like the sun. This is reminiscent of Moses. You remember when Moses was on smoky, shaky Mount Sinai. And when he came down from the presence of God, he, he received a glimpse of the presence of God. And the Bible said the people could barely look upon his face because his face, his skin shine. 
it shone like the sun. And they could barely look at him, so he put a veil over his face to talk to the people. But then he went back up to the mountain. In the presence of God, he took the veil off. Then when he came back down, his face was shining. He put the veil back on to talk to the people. What are you saying, servant of God? I'm saying that what John saw was Jesus. Not on the cross, but Jesus in the very presence of the Father. He saw the triumph triumphant King, Jesus. This is the Jesus with all authority. Jesus, the administrator. Jesus, the controller. The one who exercises all authority over the church. Because all authority has been given unto him in heaven and on earth by the one who created all things. Did I make that point clear enough? So now we can move on. Well, what is he doing? John says he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. These candlesticks represent the seven churches. And what does he have, John? Well, he's walking in the midst with seven stars in his hand. And these seven stars represent the angels of the churches. Now, seven is the number of completion. Or the number that brings things into fruition. So I'll say this and I'll move on. These seven churches represent every congregation that claim to be followers of the Christ. They represent every church of Christ that claims to be covered by the blood of Jesus. And claim him as our king. John saw, when he turned around, seven golden candlesticks. And he saw Jesus walking in the mist. In order to understand this vision, we have to go back to the Old Testament. Because what John saw was the menorah from the Old Testament tabernacle. The word menorah, the term menorah is Hebrew for lamp or lampstand. And the original menorah was built for the portable tabernacle as they traveled from Egypt to the promised land. In Exodus chapter 25 and verse number 31 through 40, God told the Israelites to make this lamp and place it in the tent of the tabernacle where God dwelled. He gave them the specifications, and they had to build it according to the pattern he showed Moses in the mount. I'm going somewhere. Now, the light from this menorah in the tabernacle was called the eternal flame. It was always burning, or the continuous fire. And it was maintained by the priest. So only the priest was allowed to touch or maintain this lamp. So the priests were responsible for cleaning the lamp and refilling it with oil every morning. I think somebody see the setup already. <laughs> so when John turned around, he saw the menorah which was in the tabernacle where God dwelled, and it represented the presence of God among the people. And if the priests did their jobs correctly and kept oil in the lamps, the fire burned, and the presence of God remained among the people. I think I'll say that again because this is the pivot point of the lesson. When John turned around, he saw the menorah, which was in the tabernacle where God dwelled and it represented the presence of God among the people. And if the priests did their jobs correctly and kept all in the lamps, the fire burned and the presence of God remained among the people. Are y'all with me thus far? This is one of those, this is a different type of lesson. It makes you shout on the inside. 
So Jesus as our high priest, John said, I saw him, he had a sash on. That's what the priest would wear on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. So he saw him not only as king of kings and lord of lords, he saw him also as high priest. And as our high priest, he takes this eternal flame and provides light to the seven churches. Then now it is our responsibility to conserve that light and ensure the presence of God is felt in Houston, Texas. And all of the earth. In John chapter 8 and verse number 12, let's put some Bible on it. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 14, he says, you are, that's a transfer on, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl instead. They put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, well, Jesus, I'm confused. How do I let this light shine? How do I keep this eternal flame burning? How do I do it? In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good. Jesus answers the question for us. How do I let my, we sing it all the time, this little light of mine. We add all kind of stuff to that song, do When I go to school, I'm going to let it shine. We, we, we have the grocery basket. When I'm in the grocery store, I'm going to let it shine. When I'm in the grocery line, I better let it shine. Well, Jesus says, this is how you let it shine. When they see your good deeds or your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. So good deeds places the spotlight not on us, but on the God we serve. That's how we let this little light shine. Now there is a part of Revelations chapter 1 that is troubling. That is, it is possible for a congregation's light to go dim. Jesus walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks and he says, you've done this well. Yet, I have this against you. And then he says, if you don't repent, if you don't change, now this is coming from the one with fire in his eye. He's the ultimate judge. He has the last say. And he says, if you don't turn, if you don't change, if you don't repent, I will come quickly and remove your lamp from the candlestick stand. So that's a troubling part of it. He puts the responsibility to repent and to keep the eternal flame burning on the churches. Amen. First Peter chapter one, first Peter chapter one and verse number nine, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. That's no coincidence. He's mentioning priesthood and light. He called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are now God's menorah. And Jesus is supplying light. Now you have the responsibility to maintain this light in a dark world. Here's the meaning, here's the meaning, and we're about to get into it. Here's the meaning. Jesus had seven stars 
in his hand. Can you picture him? It's figurative language is symbolic, but can you picture Jesus with seven stars in his hand? Now, stars were created by God. God created the stars. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 16, the Bible says, and he created the stars. And they give light to the heavens. So Jesus has stars in his hand from a supernatural source. I don't know about you, but I can't change the temperature of the sun. Sometimes we would like to, wouldn't we? But I can't change, nor can you, the temperature of the sun. It is what it is. You better put a hat on, cover yourself up if you have to. But you cannot do anything about the temperature of the sun. You cannot reduce the amount of heat or increase the amount of heat the sun puts forth. All of that is in the hands of God. So it is with the stars. John saw Jesus holding stars because Jesus had eternal energy in his hands. And with this eternal energy, this eternal light from a supernatural source, he lit the candles of the churches. He lit the golden candlesticks so the light that is inside of you and the light that is inside of me is not of this world. Amen. You have a piece of heaven. I have a piece of heaven. We, I'm not going to leave myself out. We have a piece of heaven inside of us. That's the vision John saw. And Jesus now lights the lamp. And he says, this supernatural light that is inside of you, the only way that you can activate it and glorify God is through good works. Now, I was looking for something, you know, a point that was just so large and philosophical and, you know, theologically, you know, uh, amazing. This light you have inside of you. It comes from a different place. It's supernatural. And the only way to activate it is through your good deeds. That's how you keep the eternal flame burning. So here's the lesson. God put the eternal light in Jesus. Jesus gives the light to us. And as a part of the royal priesthood, we present the light to the world through our actions. And God is magnified and receives the glory. Do we understand that? That's what John saw in a nutshell. That's what John saw. So now we understand that the light is in us. It needs to be activated. How do I do it? Through good works. There was a word called altruism. Altruism. And it means kind acts done with pure motives, expecting nothing in return. In other words, when I see a need, it's impulsive. I don't even have to think about it. When I see someone in need, I can't help myself. I have something inside of me that forces me to act. I just can't help myself, altruism. And just as the priest in the Old Testament tabernacle had to remain aware and keep an eye on this lamp and make sure the eternal flame was burning we have to keep our eyes open and we have to be aware and when we see someone in need we are not called to just see it 
We are called to act and act with pure motives, expecting nothing in return. That's how we activate this eternal, this supernatural light that is inside of us. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Y'all didn't think I was going to put Bible on it, did you? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So in other words, opportunities to do good will always present themselves. And we are not created merely to notice them, but act on them on behalf of the God we serve. We must care enough, church, to pay attention to the point where when we realize someone's fire, is growing dim around us. We should be ready to offer encouragement when we see it. You ever had a candle and one light was strong, you know, it had a good stem, and then the other one was growing a little weak, and when you take that one candle and put it with the other, that flame shoots up, and it gets stronger, it shines brighter. Altruism. Sometimes we'll see someone hurting and we see their light is burning low and we do nothing about it. That is not how we keep this eternal flame burning. Luke chapter 10, verse number 25 through 37. I believe we all know this narrative of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. There was a man traveling down the Jericho Road. And he was beaten and robbed. Left on the side of the road, half dead. Jesus says a, a priest passed by and sees him. So he is aware. He saw him. But he went on the other side of the road and passed on by. 